So good evening. My name is Sister Kathleen Duffy, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, I'm professor of physics here at Chestnut Hill College and also the director of the Institute for Religion and Science. And I would like to welcome you both to Chestnut Hill College and to our Institute's first lecture of the series for 2013-2014. So thank you for coming. Tonight we're joined by several members of the Institute's advisory committee. Um, let me see if I can find them. Ed Deviney, Frank Pennington, maybe you can uh, you know, stand up or something, Frank Hoffman, Patrick McCauley, Peter Dotson. So they give me good advice uh, about what to do. So <laughs> it's because of them that we have our speakers here tonight. So as many, of, as, you, uh, as many of you know, the Institute is dedicated to nurturing the constructive engagement of religion spirituality with science technology and endeavors to promote a dialogue that's interfaith, multi-science, and civil. Thanks to the generous support of Chestnut Hill College and the MetaNexus Institute, the guidance of our advisory committee and the expertise of our technical crew, uh, we continue to provide quality programming and we're so glad that you're able to participate. In case you're not yet on our mailing list, do sign up at the back. Uh, on the table there's a, a list that you can uh, sign up and we'll uh, send you periodically uh, updates on our events. And you will find information on our website. Uh, it's www.irands, Institute, Religion, and Science. So irands.org. You can visit us on Facebook and read our Science and Religion blog, which isn't very well populated yet, but you might want to help us with that. And um, our reading circle which meets once a month, we'll begin discussing some essays in the book at the back, uh, Rediscovering Teilhard's Fire. We'll begin on October 14th, in case you're interested in joining. We, we meet at 6.30 in the, the, the Logue Library here on the campus. And so it's my pleasure now to introduce our speakers for tonight. We have two speakers, luckily. Um, we have both an astronomer and a physicist, and uh, they are going to give us a tour of the latest, um, uh, our latest understanding of what red dwarf astronomy. Scott Engel is presently a uh, research associate and consultant in the physics department at um, Villanova University, as well as an adjunct professor at both Villanova and Chestnut Hill College. Scott has taught astronomy also at Haverford College. He's one hair's length away from a PhD in astronomy from James Cook University in Australia. So we're really happy to have him here um, to be able to talk about some of the work he is doing. His advisor was supposed to be here, and I thought maybe after the lecture he would confer the degree, but it looks like <laughs> he's going to have to wait a couple more weeks. <laughs> Scott's work in astronomy focuses on the evolution of red dwarf stars and pulsating stars. His research into these topics has included time on several of our space telescopes. That must be very interesting, actually. Our second speaker is Father Fra Frank Haig, a Jesuit and physicist who is currently Professor Emeritus of Physics at Loyola University, Maryland. Father Haig holds a licentiate in philosophy from Bellarmine College, a licentiate in sacred theology from Woodstock College, and a PhD in uh, theoretical physics from the Catholic University of America. He has served as president at Wheeling Jesuit University and also at Le Moyne College. Uh, Father Haig has also served as president of both the Washington Academy of Sciences and the Syracuse Opera Company. So he's a very well-rounded Jesuit. We're not surprised. <laughs> uh, he remains active in the university community now where he continues to enjoy the vibrant energy of campus life. 
As some of you might have guessed, Father Haig is the younger brother of late United States Secretary of State Alexander Haig. So it's my pleasure then to present to you Scott Engel, who will tell us what we know about um, red dwarf stars and their planets. And then Scott will be followed by Father Frank Haig, who will then help us to imagine what it might be like if and when we find life on one or more of these planets. We will definitely have time for comments, questions, and discussion at the end, so, be, get, so get ready for that, all right? So uh, let me uh, inter uh, uh, ask Scott to begin. He has some great slides and movies to show us. Thank you very much. It's very great to be here. Uh, as she said, my name is Scott Engel. Today we're going to be talking about research that we're carrying out at Villanova, the Living with the Red Dwarf program. And the subtitle, How Do DM Stars Age and How Do Their Plants Like It? So we talk about red dwarf stars. We also talk about DM stars, two separate names that we've applied to them. The D, of course, stands for dwarf in DM. The M refers to the spectral type of the star that we're talking about. Basically refers to the surface temperature of the star. So getting into that a little bit, here we see the Sun, which is a G-type star, specifically a G2 star, which lets you know the subclass of the star. G-type stars are, of course, hotter than M-type stars, and they're also larger. The Sun is hot enough that it is a yellow-white color on its surface, based on the type of optical radiation that it gives off. M stars are smaller and they're cooler to the point where they don't give off yellow-white light primarily. They give off most of their optical light at red wavelengths, lower energy optical light. So that's why they're called red dwarfs. They're called dwarf stars because they're on what we call the main sequence of stars. Basically, within their cores, hydrogen is being fused into helium. So we would consider the normal lifetime of a star. A star spends most of its lifetime there within the main sequence. And another term for a main sequence star is simply a dwarf star. So you can refer to the sun as a dwarf G star. You can simply refer to it as a G main sequence star. So the numbers indicate the subclass. A zero indicates the hottest of the M stars. A G zero be the hottest of G type stars. A K zero be the hottest of the K type stars. They exist between the two. K type stars are sometimes called orange dwarfs because they're not quite cool enough to be red in color. However, they are more red than the sun is, so they have an orange glow to them. So, zero stars represent the largest, the most massive, the hottest of the M-type dwarfs. And it goes down through, arguably, DM9. Things start to get a little bit, a little bit hazy when you get towards the very, very cool, the very small end of the M sequence. However, from an M0 star, you can already see a comparative size of the two. So you're talking about something about 60% as large as the sun is, and of course seven hundredths as luminous, as bright as the sun is. So even for the most luminous, the hottest of the M-type stars, we're talking about very small stars, very cool on their surface. And as you progress through the M-type sequence, now you can see you're getting down to two thousandths as luminous as the sun is, and about a quarter of the size. So this, of course, has very large consequences on how red dwarfs evolve and also what a planet would have to be like around these red dwarfs to possibly support life. One of the most fundamental characteristics that you can assign to a star is its age. All of our most recent measurements, estimates of the sun put it somewhere around four and a half billion years old, what we refer to as giga years. So here we see the present sun is at somewhere around four and a half billion years old. Classically speaking, depending on what type of star you're dealing with, you would like to be able to use one of these guys, which we call an evolutionary track. The sun, when it first formed, is believed to be about 70% as bright as it currently is in optical wavelengths, as far as visible light. Over these four and a half billion years, its luminosity has risen to its current point. It will keep on rising as it progresses through the main sequence, as it burns up that hydrogen within its core till it eventually exits the main sequence and then the stages of its life will progress very rapidly. However, we're another five or so billion years away from that. But the reason you're able to do this is because the sun is a G-type star. It's not a massive star by any means. There are many stars that are more massive than it. However, it is massive enough 
that it burns through a lot of its hydrogen fuel somewhat quickly, and you can measure its overall luminosity and assign a rough age to the star just based on that. Determining the luminosity of a star is somewhat easy to do, somewhat. You can take images of the star. We have various instruments that all measure the brightnesses of stars. So for G-type stars like the sun, for F-type stars that are even more massive than the sun is, they do change their luminosities over time. However, when you get less massive than the sun, when we talk about the K-type stars, the orange dwarfs, and especially the M-type stars, you can see these lines are essentially flat, which means that over billions years, for M-type stars even getting into trillions of years, the overall luminosity of that star will change a negligible amount. Even the best, the most precise measurements that we could make, the error that you could assign to an M star's age is pretty much the known age span of the universe. And so that's, that's more or less unacceptable when you're talking about trying to determine the age of an actual star. So, if luminosity aging, what we would call nuclear aging, because it depends on the nuclear processes in the core of the star, if that won't work, then we have to find something that will. Why is it important to determine the ages of these M dwarfs if it's going to get very difficult? Well, because here we see data from the RECONS survey. It stands for the Research Consortium on Nearby Stars, and it's run out of Georgia State University. And they've taken all the stars within what we call our solar neighborhood, our local neighborhood, talking about less than 10 parsecs away, less than about 33 light years away from the sun. And you can see these are stars that are more massive than the sun. Within terms of our local neighborhood, the sun is one of the more massive objects around. Only a handful of stars more massive than the sun within this very, very tight confine of space. G-type stars like the sun, K-type stars, and then here are the M-type stars that are within 33 light years. So as you can see, just considering proper stars that are still fusing hydrogen into helium within their cores, M dwarfs make up about 77% of the local stellar inventory. So three quarters of all of our neighbors are M dwarfs, less massive than the sun. If we also take into account brown dwarfs, which are objects that are massive enough to be hot, not massive enough to actually undergo fusion within their cores, so they're substars, stellar remnants, things like that, and we take into account white dwarfs, the spent core of a star that's left behind after a star finishes its lifetime. If we take all of this into account, M stars still make up two thirds then of the local stellar neighborhood. And we assume that this pattern would hold true throughout the galaxy, possibly throughout the entire universe. So if you're going to hope that stars can support life outside of here on Earth, you really want to see that M dwarfs can do it, because they're simply the most abundant stars out there by a long shot. So if anything can support life, you would love for it to be the M dwarfs. Now, Two slides ago, I showed you actual sizes of these guys. Here we see an M4 star now, midway along the M sequence. So middle of the road as far as M dwarf sizes, as far as M dwarf surface temperatures go. So this is the actual size of one compared to the sun, and now you see if we blow it up to the same size. As I said, nuclear aging, just figuring out the luminosity of a star and determining its age from that, cannot work for an M dwarf. M dwarfs are very small, very low luminosity. However, inside of stars, particularly cool stars like the sun, the K-type stars, and the M stars, they have different zones. You have the core, where once again hydrogen gets fused into helium, that's where the engine of the star basically is. On top of that, we have a radiative zone where energy is transferred, it bumps into one atom, excites it, de-excites it, moves in another different direction, basically a way of transporting energy. On top of that, somewhere a little over 70% of the way to the surface of the sun it changes into what we call the convective zone of the sun. It's basically a boiling motion. Very hot gas at the bottom of the convective zone rises up to the surface where it cools off, it expands, it then drops back down. This overall cycle, this is the convective motion that goes on just beneath the surface of the sun. This is very important because sun is a massive object. All stars are massive compared to planets and things like that. And they have conductive materials inside of them. When you have enough conductive material that's constantly undergoing this motion, it creates what you call a dynamo. It has a dynamo effect. So this is responsible for the very large, very powerful magnetic field that the sun has. M stars, even though they are much, much smaller than the sun is comparatively, they are almost too fully convective. 
right around M4, right around halfway through the M sequence, that's when an M star becomes what we call fully convective. It simply has its core where fusion's going on, and then the entire rest of the star is one massive convective envelope. So even though these guys are much smaller than the sun, they will produce magnetic fields that rival the suns. Because even though they're smaller, there's a larger percentage of them that's undergoing this convective motion. So you still have a great deal of matter that's undergoing this motion. Once again, conductive matter moving all around. It creates a very efficient, very strong magnetic field. That's important because the magnetic field can be used now to what we call magnetically age the M dwarf. We're not just talking about its overall luminosity, how bright it is. Now we're talking about how strong its magnetic field would be. On the left here, we see a representation of a magnetic field of an actual M star that was published in 2007. And you can see we have the poles of the magnetic field, and then at what we would call the mid latitudes of the stars, we have this toroidal shape, basically a donut shape, going all around the star. And that has some very big consequences. We can actually observe that magnetic field. Not directly, we can't actually take an image like this of any type of star, but there are what we call certain magnetic tracers, things that we can lock onto, things that we can observe and understand, and they'll tell us how the magnetic field is actually declining as the star ages. Now, one of the big lessons that you can take away from this program is trying to get outside of your comfort zone. For most humans, optical light is the comfort zone. It's what we're used to dealing with, it's what we're designed to process and to understand. Within this program, optical light is useful for some things and is actually detrimental for other things. So here, we're going to see a video. This is the sun. And this is within optical light, but it's a very, very narrow range of optical light centered on what we call an emission feature. So you can see the sun looks very different from what we are used to seeing. We can see sunspots. We can see these bright areas that are called plages, where local areas of the sun are even more active, even hotter than the rest of the surface. This is all a consequence of magnetic activity. So this is what we would call enhanced optical light. It's actually better than anything we could see with the naked eye. And we're going to see, coming from right down here, is actually a flare event, basically an explosion going on on the surface of the sun. So pay close attention, because this is what it would look like in optical light. And there it went. Did everybody actually catch that? Okay, because it will loop around slowly but surely, but it, within optical light, that is all that you're going to see happening. We have this increased area of activity, and right there, that's a flare going off on the surface of the sun in enhanced optical light, better than we could actually see with our eyes. Here now, we've gotten out of the optical range. We're into the ultraviolet and the X-ray range, so we're in very high energy activity. So you can see now the photosphere of the sun, the light emitting sphere that we're all used to seeing, is actually much darker in this image because it's not hot enough to produce gases that give off this high energy radiation. However, if we block out that optical light, we don't let it in, it's not going to throw things off for us. So we can actually see the atmosphere of the sun, the very, very hot gas that exists all around it. Surface of the sun, somewhere just under 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we're looking at 100,000 degrees Fahrenheit, things like that. Very, very hot gas. Gas that's so hot that it doesn't even give off optical light that we can process. It gives off ultraviolet and X-ray radiation. So we actually need to ignore the optical light just to get to this. So now, once again, pay attention. This area here is you're going to see the flare go off. So, obviously, it's a completely different understanding of this, just the sun, just our nearest star to us. Once you know what you're dealing with and what wavelengths of light you should be looking at. So you remember just how weak that flare looked on the previous movie, and now once again you're going to see a great ejection of matter, and then the gravity of the sun is actually going to grab it and pull it right back down onto the surface. And you can see it causing little areas to brighten up as it comes crashing back down into the surface of the sun. So the same event, depending on what wavelengths you're talking about, completely different understanding. And you'll even see a shock wave propagate right across the surface of the sun from how powerful this explosion was. Observing it in optical light, you would have no idea that this was going on. This is all a consequence of the magnetic field of the sun, and you need to get out of the optical in order to actually see it, to get rid of all that optical light that would otherwise contaminate your understanding of things. So you really need to broaden your senses. And you can actually see, when you're looking all around, these different loops that come out of the sun. All of those are magnetic loops, basically. At the poles, you can see how they form straight lines pretty much coming out. That's all 
plasma, gas that's being grabbed from the surface of the sun and carried out along this magnetic field. Like I said, sometimes it's, it's brought back crashing down onto the surface. So the magnetic field of the sun, very important, and you need to know what wavelengths you're dealing with in order to really, really understand it. So all of this brings us to how we're going to try to determine the ages of these M dwarfs. And we're hoping to do that through what we call the age rotation activity relationship. Break down how we're going to put this together. The problem with relationships is that they need to be calibrated. And we're talking about scientific relationships, not personal. So <laughs> the catch 22 is that you're trying to come up with an age-based relationship, but in order to do so, in order to have it actually be reliable, you need to start with known ages. And as I was saying, they're very rare to get. What you would like to do is find clusters and what we call moving groups, where a whole bunch of stars are moving through the universe together. And if they're doing that, you can assume that they formed together. So if they're all moving together, they formed at the same time, they all have the same age. So if you're lucky enough to find some massive stars in there that you can get a luminosity-based age for or something like that, then you can apply that age to all the stars within that group. And hopefully some M stars are in there, and now you have M stars with ages. Another way, somewhat less exciting, but still scientifically valuable, is what we call common proper motion CPM pairs. Once again, now you're just talking about two stars, but they're moving through the universe together. You can assume that they're gravitationally bound to one another, that they formed at the same time. If you're lucky enough that you have a G-type star like the sun, for which we can, quote, easily get an age, or we have a white dwarf, for which we can also, quote, easily get an age. So long as you have one of those guys in this pair and you have an M dwarf, you can determine the age for either the G-type star or the white dwarf, and you can apply that age now to your red dwarf. So you're getting this indirect aging method. But it's basically all that we have. So as you say, any port in a storm. Next step, we want to get what we call irradiance data. This is the activity now. You're looking for a sign of this magnetic field, how magnetically active the star is. So ideally, you want to observe it at X-ray wavelengths. We have ROSAT, the Röntgen satellite, which is no longer in operation, but it took all sky X-ray surveys. It took images of the stars at X-ray wavelengths, determined how bright they were at X-rays. Currently active are NASA's great X-ray observatory, Chandra, and the European counterpart, XMM. Fuse, IUE, HST, Galax, they all operate at ultraviolet wavelengths. So once again, these high energy wavelengths, they're the best. We don't want the photosphere, we don't want the optical brightness of these stars contaminating our ultraviolet and our UV data. We just want to see those wavelengths. However, if you're forced to do it, we can get optical spectra of the star, pass that light through a prism, spread its rainbow out, all the wavelengths, measure them individually. How bright is a star at this wavelength? How bright is a star at that wavelength? And we can, in a real pinch, even try to use infrared spectra. For this, we'd like to use NASA's great infrared observatory, the Spitzer Space Telescope. So that's how we get the activity level, try to measure how strong the magnetic field is. The last one is technically the easiest to do. We want to determine how these guys are rotating. You take enough images of these stars over time, you take enough brightness measures, as I'm going to get into, that can tell you how they are rotating. The rotation of this star plays along with that convective motion, that boiling motion. It's all moving that plasma around. So it all has a consequence of how strong their magnetic fields are. So you can determine the rotation rate. You can also determine indirectly how strong the magnetic field is. This is how we're going to try to put together these relationships. We start with ages. Said the stereotypically most prominent method is going with clusters. Ideally, you'd love to see something like this in your images. You want you know that there is this one large scale entity there. It's obviously something going on. It's bound all these stars to one another. You can assume they're more or less the same age. You know there's something going on there. That's a very nice, exciting cluster. And you get down to these guys where it is still a cluster of stars. You can see that there's a higher concentration within here. And then you have fields like this, where it basically looks like a random star field However, plenty of astronomers have studied it. They've put together all the motions of those stars, and they've found that within this image, there's a large number of stars that are all moving together. So some of these guys are background stars. Some of these guys are foreground stars. They're not related to each other. But there's a certain subset that are moving together. You can assume they're all the same age. The good thing about this is it's kind of a shotgun method, where when you take this one image, you can get the brightnesses of a whole bunch of stars. So you can save your telescope's precious time. You don't have to go all over the sky to observe these guys. That's nice. So if you thought these guys were exciting, then common proper motion pairs definitely aren't. Within this entire field, 
I, 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 don't, I don't care about the rest of these stars. Here we're talking about the common proper motion pair. This guy is a white dwarf. This guy is a red dwarf. So I'm taking one image again. I'm taking this image though just to get brightness measures of that guy. That's the only one I'm really looking for as far as this program is concerned. Somebody else wants to use the data for other things. That's great. It's great for them. And I do study these other stars to make sure and nothing else is interesting is going on with them. But as far as this program is concerned, I'm just going after that guy. So it's somewhat inefficient use of the telescope's time, but once again, you deal with what you've got. Moving on to the activity measures now. As I said, we're looking for these magnetic tracers. And remember, once again, you have to get outside of your comfort zone. The sun at optical light, now it's not enhanced optical light. We can see sunspots, some of those bright features, those plages I was showing you in the enhanced image, they're not visible anymore because the photosphere of the sun is just too bright. We can't pick out those small little features anymore. Here is now ultraviolet light but somewhat broad ultraviolet light. We're not really narrowing it down, but we've blocked out the optical light. So once again, you can see where the sunspots are, and you can kind of make them out in here, but now you can see these bright areas, these plages that are popping up all around the sun. Those are all regions where the magnetic field is very, very strong. Once again, you can't see them in optical, you can see them in the ultraviolet. And finally, we have the X-ray image that we were talking about, where the photosphere is now almost black in certain areas because it's just not hot enough to give off this type of radiation. And we can see this entirely different picture emerging where we can see the magnetic field of the sun and how the plasma is being carried around and heated up to these hundreds of thousands of degrees, even millions of degrees. But it's very important to get to its very specific wavelengths. But, as I said, in a pinch, you can use optical data. So here at the bottom, we see the wavelengths of light that we're dealing with. Somewhere of 6400 to 6600, we're talking about reddish light now. And there is one line. It's given off by hydrogen gas, so we call the hydrogen alpha line. Very, very popular line to use. It comes from temperatures somewhere around 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit, something around there. So it's the low part of the atmosphere of the sun, the cool part of the atmosphere, still hotter than the surface of the sun is. And you see, in a very young star like this, a star that's only 650 million years old, this line is very prominent, and it shows up above all of this here, which is what's being given off by the photosphere, the surface of the sun. However, by the time you get to the sun's age, time you get to around 4.5 billion years old, that line is now pretty much gone. It's being swamped out, once again, by all of this other radiation that the surface is giving off. So it can be useful, but only in limited amounts. It has to be somewhat young stars. They have to have such a strong magnetic field that this emission line here can pop up above all of the rest of this mess, basically. Here we see ultraviolet data now that we just got about a month ago from the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is one of our red dwarfs. This guy is about 4 billion years old, so almost the sun's age. And remember, by that age, the hydrogen alpha line is pretty much gone. It's just there within the rest of that continuum noise. At ultraviolet wavelengths, though, there is none of that radiation. All, all this is zeroed out because, once again, the surfaces of these guys are not hot enough to give off radiation here. Now, all we're seeing is the excited gases, the excited plasmas that exist around these guys within their atmospheres. We see emission lines that are being produced by carbon, carbon, silicon, oxygen, oxygen again. We see all these different gases. These are from very, very hot plasmas. Once again, we're talking about 20,000 degrees Fahrenheit up to hundreds of thousands of degrees Fahrenheit. They're the only ones that can get hot enough to give off radiation at these wavelengths. So getting outside of that optical regime can really improve the situation. Now we have nothing else to deal with. All we're seeing is what the atmosphere of this star is up to. It's very, very hot gas, and it's all being heated up by that magnetic field. So it's very important to get outside the optical wavelengths, and we can use these lines to measure overall how strong that magnetic field is, and then we have the activity measures for our stars. Rotation, as I said, fairly, fairly simple in comparison. We just keep on taking images of these guys, and we put together what we call photometry, basically measuring the brightness of the star. So you take one image, measure how bright the star was in that image. Take another one, measure how bright the star was. You just keep on going night after night after night. If you're lucky, a pattern will emerge like this. The star will get dimmer, it will get brighter, and then it will repeat itself. It will keep on going dimmer, brighter, dimmer, brighter. The consequence of that is that at one point, you're looking at the side of the star, the hemisphere of the star, with more spots on it. And at another time, you're looking at the hemisphere of the star that has fewer spots. 
And as that star spins around, it brings the spots back into view, and it brings fewer spots into view. Then more spots, then fewer spots. And if you're lucky enough to see that happen several times over, you know you're dealing with a rotating star. And you can put together how long it's taking for that star to rotate because of this brightening, dimming, brightening, dimming pattern. This guy, for instance, takes it about 46 days or so to rotate, compared to the sun's roughly 25 days to rotate. So talking about a somewhat slow rotator, based on our early relationships, it puts somewhere around three and a half billion years. Rotating more slowly than the sun, but it's younger than the sun, because M dwarfs behave very differently, as we're going to get into. And that, of course, throws everything off, as it has to do. Sometimes it takes a while. Here we're talking about one year's worth of data, the second year's worth of data, the third year's worth of data. And here's a close-up of one of those years where you can see, once again, brightening, dimming, brightening, dimming, brightening, dimming. Keeps on going on, but it's actually getting smaller and smaller, the amplitude with which the brightness changes. That's because spots don't just stay the same. They don't stay in the same spot. They don't stay the same size. Spots can grow. They can shrink. They can evaporate entirely. So what we're seeing over the course of just this one observing season was that either the spots were going away on one side and growing on the other. Anything could be happening. They could be migrating to different hemispheres. The bottom line is you're talking about starting off with one hemisphere that's very spotted and another hemisphere that's not very spotted. And one way or the other, they're evening themselves out. So if I were to start observing a star somewhere around here, I might not even pick up the fact that it's spinning because you need to have that difference. You need to have one side of the star much more spotted or much less spotted than the other. And it can change over time. This guy, fortunately, things have worked out. Year after year, we've been able to lock onto this again. And you fold that all onto itself, and you decide that it takes just about 14 days for that guy to rotate. So a pretty rapid rotator there. About 500 million years old. And it's actually another part of one of these clusters that we've talked about. This one's the Ursa, Ursa Major group, obviously named after the constellation that it's found in. Other guys can take a really long time to figure out how they're rotating, because M stars can have very long rotation rates. This guy, for instance, is talking about the first year, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh year. So we observed this guy for seven straight years. The very first time we started observing it, we saw it get brighter and dimmer, but then it went below the horizon, so we couldn't observe it anymore. So we saw what looked like rotation, and we figured, you know, well, maybe this is exactly how long it takes to rotate. Maybe it would have just started the whole process again. We don't know. Came back the next year, we saw it once again brighten and dim, but then it went out of view again, went below the horizon, so we couldn't keep observing it anymore. It took a few years of it not doing anything. The hemispheres must have equalized how many spots they have. Something like that happened. Finally, now one, two, three, four, five years after we started observing it, we finally saw the opposite happen. Not just brightening and then dimming, we finally saw that valley, the actual dip in its light curve. We used to think that it took about 88 days or so to rotate. Five years later, when we finally observed the full effect, we realized that it takes about 116 days to rotate. So it takes this guy almost four months just to spin around once. And it turns out that's just a little bit longer than its actual observing season, and it is above our horizon. So it took us five years just to lock on to this guy's rotation rate. So even though it's easy enough just to get these pictures, you might have to wait years before you can actually put together a rotation rate. So it, it can become difficult. Based on this rotation rate, I figure it's about six to seven billion years old. So now we're talking about a star older than the sun. But once again, at four and a half billion years old, it takes the sun 25 days to rotate. This guy takes 116 days to rotate. So M dwarfs can be very, very difficult. What does this all have to do with our relationships now? The first one, age on the x-axis here, expressed in billions of years, giga years, and we see the rotation period. And for a long time, this was what we were left with. We had our clusters, our moving groups here, they're very young ages. They're all less than a billion years. We have one random little group that people say is two billion years old, and we love to think that they're right because it's a very important age range for us. Proxima Centauri, the closest star to the sun, named Proxima because of its proximity to the sun. So it's the closest star that we have, somewhere around five billion years old, and we're able to get a rotation rate for that guy because it's so close, it's easy to take nice pictures of it. After that, we only have what we call statistical ages. The Milky Way right now is this very nice spiral galaxy. But when it first formed, and we're talking about billions of years ago, anywhere 11 to 13 or so billion years ago, it was this massive cloud complex that was just starting to fragment, just starting to collapse down into a galaxy. So the very first stars that formed, they formed all over in this roughly spherical pattern, and they're moving all over the place. Whereas the sun exists right nicely within the disk of the Milky Way, and it's simply orbiting around the center of the Milky Way within that disk. 
But if you can see a star and you know that it's on its way out of the disk, up, out of the disk, down, it's going to take itself a long distance away, you can assume that it formed such a long time ago that the Milky Way didn't exist as a nice disk yet. It hadn't yet collapsed down into that shape. So you have this statistical age, the very large ever bar, and it's just, you know, it, it's all we've got. What are you, you, know, you going to do? Now, having found these white dwarf, red dwarf pairs, we have a lot more stars with actually known ages. So we're starting to fill in this relationship. And here we have a selection effect. We have these older guys that we're still trying to observe, we're still taking images of, but they could be rotating at such long rates that's going to take us years just to see their full cycle. So we're starting to populate the relationship down here at what we call these short rotation rates, only on the order of a couple months to rotate. But it's all we can do so far. We keep on taking these images, we keep on watching these guys, and we're just waiting for them to give up their secrets. But so far, it's agreeing well. The exception of possibly these two guys right here. And as you can see as we zoom in, did this go? There we go. They are an M0 and an M0.5 star. So they're the most massive, they're the hottest of the M stars. They're almost K-type stars. So here you can see the relationship on how K stars spin down, their rotation rate slow with age. And here you can see what G-type stars like the sun do. So you can see that these guys, which are kind of between, you know, the regular M dwarfs and the K dwarfs, they're also based on their rotation rates in between the two. So not only can we just say, what do M dwarfs do? Now we have to take into account, are they hot M dwarfs? Are they mid-range M dwarfs? Are they cool M dwarfs? So more and more complications keep on popping up. For the most part, the relationship is filling itself out nicely. When we eventually get enough stars with rotation rates, then we can start saying, well, what would a hot M dwarf do? What would an M0 star do? And what would an M3 star do? Things like that. But we're nowhere near that level yet. That's the rotation over time. Now we see what we call the log of the X-ray luminosity. So how bright is the star X-ray wavelengths? How much of this very, very hot millions of degrees plasma exists in its atmosphere? All consequence of the magnetic field. And you can see how, over time, the X-ray luminosity, the X-ray brightness of these stars drops off a great deal. So once again, this is the magnetic field weakening as the star spins down, as its rotation rate lengthens, and we can observe these guys at X-ray wavelengths, figure out how bright they are at X-ray wavelengths, and we can try to figure out what their age is. And the er problem with that is this error bar right here. That's not actually an error in the measurement that we have. It's the fact that stars have X-ray cycles to them. The sun has an X-ray cycle. Almost all these cooler stars that we observe, they all have X-ray cycles. At one year, they're going to be very bright. Several years later, they'll become very dim in X-rays, and that's about this much worth of error that it puts into your data. So X-ray data is hard to get because it's obtained by satellites in orbit around the Earth, and they're not just giving time away to anybody who asks for it. You have to compete. You have about a 12% chance or so of getting it approved in any given year. It becomes very, very difficult. But we are trying. We have gotten a lot of different targets approved, some of which are on this graph, and it's starting to put together a pretty nice relationship. So hopefully in the future, you'll be able to simply get an X-ray image, although you will have to get a few, so you know you're not looking at just a random part of the cycle, and you'll be able to determine an age for the guy just from its X-ray brightness. That is, our, that is our prayer. Here we have our most recent data. It's coming in from Hubble now. I showed you the UV spectrum. This guy is for a very specific line given off now by magnesium plasma. And you can see, once again, from a very young star going down to the sun's age, it really, really starts to just flatten out in its activity. So they become very, very lowly active at these UV plasmas. Once again, as we hopefully finish this guy out with more and more ultraviolet data, which they are not giving away, especially on Hubble. Hubble, you have less than a 10% chance now of getting approved in any given year. But we keep on trying because we're silly like that. So figure out activity levels, rotation rates, ages, trying to put together these relationships. Now we're going to try to use this to figure out what we call the tricky issue of habitability. And if you thought a lot went into the relationships, determining whether something's habitable or not, oh, it, things get really, really silly. So DM star, habitable zone, what we call the Earth equivalent distance. The classical way of calculating the habitable zone around a star is simply based on distance from that star and the luminosity of that star. How bright is that star? How much radiation is it putting off into the solar system? And how far away are you from it? That simply tells you how much radiation your planet should be absorbing, and it'll tell you how hot your planet should be, classically speaking. It makes a lot of assumptions. But 
the Earth's equivalent distance. We know how far we are from the sun. We know how luminous the sun is. We simply scale that down to these smaller and cooler stars. You bring your planet in, it should be roughly as warm as the Earth would be around the sun. Closest planet to the sun, Mercury, hovers somewhere around four-tenths of an AU away from the sun. Mercury is nowhere near habitable. It's just way too close to its star. You're talking about the hottest, the most massive of M dwarfs. You're talking about being closer than Mercury is to the sun just to be habitable, just to get enough radiation from that guy because it's so small and it's so cool. So they start here, a little over a quarter of an AU, one astronomical unit. That's how far the Earth is from the sun. So about one-fourth of that distance away, you would be at the Earth equivalent distance for an M0 guy, the biggest, the hottest M dwarfs they have. As you progress down the M star sequence, you really start to get close to your star. Down here at M8, the very, very smallest official stars there are that actually have fusion going on in their cores, are you talking about two hundredths of an AU away. So you're talking about 50 times closer to your star than the Earth is to the sun, just to get enough light, enough warmth for your planet to have an agreeable climate. So that has a very big consequence on what's actually going to happen. This is the classical way of calculating it, just based on the overall luminosity. But overall luminosity isn't just what matters. You also have that ultraviolet light to contend with. This is taken from the IUE satellite, the International Ultraviolet Explorer, satellite that was in existence around the Earth. It did have the record for the longest operating satellite until Hubble recently eclipsed that record. As you can see, so here we go, 1,500 angstroms to 3,000 angstroms, talking about roughly where the cutoff is between what we would call the near ultraviolet and then the far ultraviolet. This line right here is very important because that wavelength's shorter than that, shorter than roughly 2,800 angstroms. Anything higher energy than that, anything shorter wavelength than that, and you're not just talking about sunburn anymore, you're talking about actually damaging the DNA of an organism. And that's, of course, something you want to keep a good eye on when you're talking about whether or not an object's going to be habitable. Uh, talking about medical professions, things like that, they have sterilizing machines that they put their instruments into, and when they sterilize them, they actually zap them with UVA radiation because it's so good at killing things. And it's actually not within the range of DNA damage. So, just to let you know how harmful UV light can be, like I said, the, the best UV light, the most agreeable UV light around is used to sterilize equipment because it will kill what it comes into contact with when it's in large enough doses. So, as it turns out, the atmosphere is very, very good at cutting all the radiation off short of 2,000 angstroms. That leaves you this range here where the Earth's atmosphere is letting little, little bits in. It still cuts down most of it, but when you're talking about DNA damage, most of it isn't good enough. That's why you still don't want to just go out into the sunlight for hours on end without putting something on, without covering up somehow, putting sunblock on, anything like that. When you're talking about getting right on top of your M star, even though they're much weaker than the K stars or the G stars are at their ultraviolet activity, once again, even little bits can be harmful. It can still sterilize the surface of your planet and it'll keep life from forming. Here we see what we call an action spectrum. We're talking about just how much action it would cause, which is a nice way of saying how much damage it'll cause. But scientists, they like to, like to term things more friendly than that. So it's called an action spectrum. Now you can see two lines here. We have the erythmal action spectrum. We're talking about sunburn here, erythema. The dotted line is, once again, DNA damage. So you can see as we go through UVA light, they still cause it, but as you go through UVB into UVC, the damage that the radiation is doing really starts to jump up. So here, about 2,800 angstroms, which they're talking about, that's where DNA damage really starts to kick in, but it's always going on. Amounts of UV light, even if it's UVA, as I said, it's used in sterilizing machines because it still gets damage done. So it's always doing something. You're around an M dwarf, and for the most part, they're much quieter at ultraviolet light. However, M dwarfs are also called flare stars, and they're called that for a reason. I was showing you that movie of the sun and those explosions that go off on its surface. Nowadays, we're at four and a half billion years old. It doesn't happen all that often, especially a strong flare on the sun. M dwarfs really like to give off flares. It's a consequence of the very efficient magnetic fields that they make. Up here, we see observations, photometry, that we're carrying out measurements of the brightness of an M dwarf AD Leo. This is a very, very young star, only about 100 million years old. So in terms of stars, very young. Each one of these tick marks here is one hour worth of time. 
and here's a strong flare, and there's another strong flare, and there's another strong flare, and there's another one. Adelio, on average, has 17 strong flares every day. So, talking about life trying to form, primordial life trying to form on a planet around AD Leo, well, 17 times a day it's being zapped by an ultraviolet flare. Down here, we see those spectra again. And you remember, in the last slide, I've shown you that they can be very quiet in terms of their ultraviolet spectrum, almost flatline, except for some of these emission lines that are coming from the atmosphere. But when a flare goes off, the whole situation changes. You're talking about the overall radiation. Remember, the great thing about ultraviolet data is that M dwarfs are too cool to actually give off that continuum radiation, that radiation that's all over the place. But when they flare, they give off that continuum radiation. It can be anywhere 40 to 100 times more ultraviolet radiation than you're used to getting from that guy. This happens roughly 17 times a day when you're around AD Leo. So you're much, much closer to your star, but 17 times a day, it's just zapping your planet with ultraviolet light. So things can start to become tricky. So people back in 2010, they realized that M dwarfs especially would not have just your normal habitable zone, this classical habitable zone. They would also have an ultraviolet habitable zone. There are certain times, we're talking about the masses of stars now, where you need to be for these low mass M dwarfs. This is how close you would need to be in order to get enough light. This is how close you would need to be in order to get enough ultraviolet light. So now they don't overlap. As it turns out, right around one solar mass, which is right where the sun is, they overlap very nicely. So that could make the situation great for G-type stars, but we're not interested in them, we're talking about the M-type dwarfs. So you have this interplay between how much UV light they're giving off and how much optical light they're giving off. Here are some of the nearby stars to the sun. We see that star AD Leo is talking about. When AD Leo is quiet, you really want to be close to the guy in order to get enough UV light. Because UV light isn't only damaging, it turns out. You need to have little bits of UV light getting to the surface so it can challenge life while it's trying to form. It wants to see a little bit of UV light because it'll force it to adapt. It'll force it to try to evolve and protect itself from the UV light that it's getting. So too much UV light is just as bad as too little UV light. If you're not getting enough UV light, basically your life forms will get lazy and they won't try to better themselves because they're not being challenged in any way. So when AD Leo is quiet, you're not getting enough UV light. You want to be this close. When AD Leo has a strong flare, well, now you want to instantly move your planet out to this far away, which obviously you can't do. And this green bar here shows you where you would like to be in order to get enough optical light, enough overall light so that your climate is good on your planet. So you can see this difference between quiet, strong flare, and of course what's going on at these optical wavelengths. So the whole situation of whether or not a star can be habitable, whether or not it can have a habitable planet around it, starts to become very tricky. Up here, you see GJ876. Well, they say GL. A lot of these red dwarfs were cataloged by two astronomers, Glisa and Jaris. So there's a GJ catalog. At some point, I don't know what Jaris did to upset people, but they dropped him from the catalog, and they simply say GL for the Glisa catalog. I always like to call them GJ just to give Jaris his due. So there's a little bit about me. But GL or GJ876, it actually has planets that are already found around it. That's what these triangles are. The one guy you can see is getting enough optical light, and it's actually technically within that star's habitable zone. It could be habitable. But it wants to be this close in order to get enough ultraviolet light when the star is quiet to challenge life to evolve. GJ849, another M dwarf, doesn't have any known planets within its habitable zone, anywhere within its habitable zone. But once again, this is where you'd like to be when it's quiet, you know, UV light. That's where you'd like to be at optical light. GJ581, now that's an exciting star because it has planets around it. One of them is actually within its classical habitable zone. But once again, you might not be getting nearly enough UV light when the guy is quiet. But when it's flaring, the odds are you're going to start getting too much. So you need to figure out just how often your star flares and where you're going to be, and will it all average out to get something that you could conceivably call habitable. Everything starts to get very strange when you're talking about these guys. Here we see now a system, the GJ581 planetary system. It says multiple planets that have been found around it. We see the star, obviously, at the center of the system, planet E, planet B, and here's planet C. And it's right at the inner edge of what we call the extended habitable zone. Now you're not just talking about how much light, how much warmth that star would be giving off. Now you're taking into account what the atmosphere of your planet's like. And it's a way of kind of fudging the habitable zone and making it extend itself out a little bit more. Technically, if you were to take Venus 
and you were to move it out in Mars's distance, it could be habitable because Venus has a lot more carbon dioxide, a lot more greenhouse gases in its atmosphere. So even though it's further away from the sun, it's trapping in a lot of that heat. So Venus could be a habitable place if you moved it out to Mars's distance. If you took Mars with its very weak atmosphere and you moved it in at Venus's distance, much, much closer to our sun, even though it can't trap that heat as well as Venus does, it doesn't need to because now it's closer to the sun. So Mars could also be habitable if it were just at the right location. So if you take into account that you know what's going on in the atmosphere and there are different fudge effects, you can really extend that habitable zone out. So we could include planet C. We could even include this other planet, planet D, within the habitable zone, depending on what type of atmosphere they have. So that makes a good case for GJ581. Outside of the optical light, outside of the UV light, you also have to worry about what these guys are doing at X-ray wavelengths. As M dwarfs age, and as G dwarfs like the sun age, they both weaken, as I showed you on that slide, in terms of their X-ray luminosity. They become much more X-ray quiet. However, the G stars really drop off. They become very X-ray quiet as they get old. The M dwarfs, because they're so efficient at making that magnetic field, they stay more active in terms of their X-rays when compared to the sun. So when you are born, if you will, around an M dwarf, you're getting you know, almost the same amount, a little bit more X-rays than you would around the sun, depending on your distance away from it. But as you age, if we go up to here, 4 billion years old now, we're younger than the sun is, you're talking about getting almost 20 times the X-ray radiation from your M star than we get from the sun. X-ray radiation is also harmful. Of course, the atmosphere does a very good job of blocking X-ray radiation, but it has this tendency to heat up the outer atmosphere of your planet, and it could cause that atmosphere to start evaporating away. And of course, that's another thing you want to keep a really good eye on if that starts to happen. As you get to even more advanced forms of life, if they're on that planet, and you get to the point of 6 billion years old, well, now you're getting almost 30 times as much X-ray radiation from your sun. If you got to a very, very old star, 8 billion years old now, the sun is very quiet at X-ray radiation. Your M dwarf, though, you're getting 50 times, more than 50 times, the X-ray radiation. So this just adds another level onto where that habitable zone can exist around a star. But as I said, if you take things really for granted and you start to optimize everything so it's all in your favor, you can have this extended habitable zone. And in the case of something like Gliese, although it should be Gliese and Jaris, 581, you have a planet that could be within the extended habitable zone, one that is actually right in the middle of that habitable zone, which is a very exciting star, but it's, it's a very exciting planet, but it's still debated. The planet hunting field within astronomy has become really cutthroat. There are two groups that are the primary planet hunters. There's an American group and there's a European group. And when one group publishes they found a planet, the other group tends to publish that they don't see that planet and vice versa. And so they will argue about planets as far as things go on. One group will tell the others that their instrument's better so they know what's going on. And the other group will tell them, well, don't make fun of our instrument, we know what's going on. You know, and it keeps on going back and forth, it's odd. So. Planet G, which would be right smack dab in the middle of this habitable zone, you can fudge the atmosphere in all sorts of different directions, it's still habitable. The Europeans said that they found it, the Americans say, no you don't. And so they keep on going back and forth. So it's still debated. C, being on the inner edge, as long as you had enough cloud cover, something like that, it could be habitable. Exactly what type of planet it would be and what type of life you would find on there. If you're talking about little green people, they'd have to be somewhat hardy in their existence. It wouldn't be your stereotypical little green people you're talking about. Because not only are you talking about putting up with about two and a half times the gravitational force that we feel here on the surface of the Earth, but you're still very close to your planet. So you're at, you're at the hot edge of that habitable zone. So you could have this, this desert world. And I guess, like I said, some, you know, some little green people could survive. It just all depends on exactly how they grew up. Somewhat recent discovery just came out last year. Now we're around GJ667, so another red dwarf. Here we see the sun's solar system. Down here we see the stellar system of GJ667C, member of a triple star system. Component C is an M dwarf, a red dwarf. And you can see that it has a planet right here, and you don't have to extend the habitable zone yet again. And this planet isn't just debated, both groups of planet hunters agree that it does exist. So it's right there. You don't need to have strong cloud coverage to start blocking out that sun's light. You don't need to have strong carbon dioxide within your atmosphere to suck up more of the sun's light. It can have a normal Earth-like atmosphere, and it can actually be habitable. So we're entering into this age now where habitable 
planets somewhat like the Earth, although we don't know what their atmospheres are made of. But in terms of mass, this guy's close in mass to the Earth. It's what we call a super Earth. So it is more massive, just like that GJ581 planet. So it will have strong gravity, but you don't need to fudge its atmosphere. You don't need to hope it's covered by all these water vapor clouds in order to block the sun's light out. It could be classically habitable. So it's an exciting discovery. One of the best ways that we have nowadays of finding plants, the Kepler mission, a satellite that was launched specifically to stare at a little patch of the universe day after day after year after year and just keep on measuring the brightnesses of every star that it saw. And what you want to see is just a little, little dip in that brightness because that's a planet now just moving in front of that star. And it's been doing this very successfully. It's starting to find a couple thousand possible plants. Of course, they all need to be confirmed by people on the ground, but they're still great candidates, and at least now you know where to look. They recently released this study, as you can see just back in February of this year, in which they're starting to say that it could be 6% of red dwarf stars that would possess an ocean-friendly, Earth-sized atmosphere. So they're taking some of their preliminary results that they're getting from the satellite, what few stars, what few planets they have actually confirmed exist, and the ones that they believe do exist, and you extrapolate that into, if we weren't just looking at this one little patch, if we were looking at the entire sky, how would this figure out for everybody? They say 6% of these red dwarf stars could possess at least the right type of planet. Whether or not it has the right type of atmosphere, everything, is it water vapor, is it carbon dioxide, things like that, you're not quite sure. But 6%, 1 16th of 3 quarters of our local stellar neighborhood, now you're talking about really getting the odds up that you can find habitable plants around these stars. So it's an exciting result that they released. So far, all the planets that we know, one of those guys that was confirmed by the Kepler satellite, these are the most habitable planets, the most Earth-like planets, just based on how far away they are from their respective star and what mass we think they are, how close they are to the Earth. We have the top six. This guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy. Four of the six are around M dwarfs. So, what we currently know, two-thirds of the most habitable, the most Earth-like plants known so far are around red dwarfs. So once again, they're the most popular stars out there. Currently, they also have the most Earth-like plants that we know of. So, once again, it's a very exciting field that you want to try to figure out whether or not they can actually be habitable. It's got M dwarf, M dwarf, M dwarf, M dwarf. This guy's around a K dwarf, so an orange dwarf now. This guy is around a G type dwarf like the sun. So that's also a very exciting planet to keep an eye on because you don't have to worry about just how different its star is. It's also around a star just like our sun. So in the end, what are we left with? We feel that we're closing in on what we would consider to be a reliable age activity rotation relationship. And I said our goal is that if we can get these guys really well calibrated, that means that in the future you can stare at any red dwarf out there within the universe, and so long as you can either get how fast it's rotating, how bright is the UV light, how bright is the X-ray light, that's all you need is just one of those three measures, and we can tell you how old it is, and that would be very nifty. The database is continually expanding, Un unfortunately or fortunately, depending on what you talk about, how busy you want us to be. We're always carrying out new observations, at least from the ground, to see how these guys are rotating. We're always asking the UV and the X-ray satellites to give us more time. And sometimes they say yes and sometimes they say no, but we keep on trying. Third one, the habitability of DM stars. As I said, it's a very, very tricky question, but given how popular they are, given how they already have these plants that are starting to be found around them in high numbers that are could be Earth-like. It's just a very important question to find out. And in the end, you really hope it works out, but it might not. You don't know. So thank you very much for your time.